So welcome everyone to Partners in Pain. My name is Erin Sobko and I'll be your facilitator for today's session. Thank you for joining us. I would like to first of all recognize that we live in treaty territory and in Yorkton it's treaty for territory and in the spirit of truth and reconciliation I'd like to acknowledge that. Partners in Pain grew out of the Improving Pain in Saskatchewan Collaborative Research Project. The research project aims to give pain a voice by bringing people together to share information and plan action to improve how pain is managed in our province. The research project led to our first pilot series of Partners in Pain webinars in March of 2021. The feedback from the pilot was very positive and led the research team to seek additional funding to help support the continuation of the webinars. Partners in Pain received a community initiatives grant in mid-2021 for an additional series of webinars, which is what brings us here today. And all of this work is supported by Sask Pain, a nonprofit organization which is on a mission to help improve the lives of those living with pain in Saskatchewan. Tonight, this webinar is sponsored by the Chiropractors Association of Saskatchewan. So a huge thank you to CIS for their support of the, their partners or this Partners in Pain webinar. So our etiquette, just a few reminders before I introduce our first speaker, please keep yourself muted while our presenter is speaking to minimize background noise. We are certainly happy to see all of your faces. So feel free to keep your video on. But if you are having connection issues, you can turn it off. And there will also be an opportunity to ask questions during the session. So please submit your questions in the chat box and myself and Celine will be monitoring them and we will share them with our presenter. So now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker for today, Dr. Pa Paul Mashowski. Dr. Mashowski is a neurologist and assistant professor, professor of neurology at the University of Saskatchewan. He graduated from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario with a doctor of medicine in 2005 and completed a neurology residency program at the University of Saskatchewan in 2010. Dr. Mashowski is currently practicing in Saskatoon. So uh, take it away, Dr. Mashowski. Hi everyone, thanks Erin for that introduction. Thanks to the group for inviting me to join this uh, session. I'm happy to be here. I think you guys are doing important work and uh, I'm happy to be part of that and invited here. So I'm gonna try to share my screen, which hopefully will work as well as it did the last time we tried this. Click share, click on this here. All right, it says I'm screen sharing. Does that come through for other people? I got some thumbs up. That's a good sign. So, um, so I'm a neurologist and I'm mainly a migraine doctor. I see a lot of patients with headaches and, and migraine is the best example of a sort of typical neurological headache disorder. I'm gonna talk about that. Um, I wanted to talk sort of more broadly about some ideas related to migraine that I think are more applicable to chronic pain in general. Um, so the talk is way too long for this session. Uh, I like to talk, I'm guilty of that. Uh, so I went into medicine, so I'd have an excuse to talk about something. Um, so I, I'll gloss over a lot of this, but I wanted to make the notes fairly detailed in case some of the participants want to review them in their own time. If they find that helpful or educational, then I think the notes will be made available. Is that right? Okay. So uh, I'll go through this. Oh, wow. Sorry, I guess there's only animations in this. Um, so we'll talk about classifying headaches, um, talk about red flags for certain types of headaches that are sort of more dangerous than the typical uh, chronic headaches that are related to migraine, discuss chronic migraine in some more detail as a diagnosis and try to connect, as I say, the, the neurophysiology, the, the background biological reality of migraine to a broader pattern of what we call central sensitization, which is part of the chronic pain syndrome. Um, I guess that concept is not going to be new to your group entirely, but um, I thought I'd just try to tie in some of the neuroscience of it. So when we classify headaches as doctors, we basically talk about two types of things. There's primary headaches, which happen as disorders by themselves for no particular pathological or, or bad reason. 
Um, and migraine is the classic example of that. There are others, but we're just gonna focus on migraine in this talk. Um, secondary headaches are headaches that are caused by some other sort of particular badness, such as a head injury or a brain tumor or some other kind of thing like that. Um, so primary and secondary headaches is one of the first questions for a doctor. So when I'm teaching this to doctors, the first thing we have to discuss is, is this headache dangerous? And so we talk about these things here listed as red flags, and I won't review them in detail, but just to say that they're not typically major factors in the people who are suffering from chronic headaches, especially over many years, um, you know, maybe coming and going a bit or getting worse over time gradually. Um, some of this involves the clinical examination. So patients with chronic headaches, I like to examine them. Uh, and make sure that their neurological examination is as expected. Um, we also talk about yellow flags, or at least this is a phrase that I made up maybe. So these are things, oh, oops, I went back too far. My apologies. Um, sorry, I've got to tab through this again. So these are things that are sort of more concerning about a, a headache pattern, but, but still not especially dangerous or unusual. Um, and, uh, in general, as doctors, you know, we only see people whose headaches sort of bother them. And so almost always by the time someone comes to the doctor to tell them about a headache, it's going to be a story of my headache's worse than usual, or it's different than usual. People don't tend to come in and say, oh, doc, I've got the same headache I've had forever, and I just wanted to tell you about it today. Um, so in some sense, we always see some kind of change or evolution in the story from our side of the table when patients tell us about their pain syndrome with their headaches. Um, so the question is sort of how best to manage that. So you may be familiar, or some of you may have heard of this thing called choosing wisely, which is uh, mostly oriented at primary care doctors, like family doctors and emergency doctors. And it's trying to decide which patients with which types of problems need certain kinds of investigations done. And the key point here is that in patients with chronic headaches, um, the yield of something significant or important on neuroimaging is fairly low. It's well under 5%. Um, depending on how you define significant, I'd argue it's even lower than 1% as is quoted here in the statistic. But that number of, you know, the number of people with headaches where we find something significant on a scan is the same in people who don't have headaches. So I could just go across the street here in Stonebridge to the co-op gas bar and take the people who are paying too much for gas tonight uh, and put them in the scanner and I would find roughly the same amount of, or at least have the same chance of finding problems in those patients as I do in my patients with chronic, chronic headaches. So there's multiple guidelines that recommend against routine headache imaging. That becomes an issue sometimes with patients, understandably, who are concerned about their suffering and wanting to know what's going on. Many people assume quite naturally that if their head hurts, there must be something wrong with it, especially something that we can see. And so that is often on their agenda when they come to see me. Um, so that is a fair point though, even at a specialist level like my, my own, um, I try not to scan patients with chronic headaches if I don't have to in that sense, or if I don't think it's necessary from a medical standpoint. Sometimes I'll do that simply for reassurance's sake, um, but if the scan uh, is not entirely necessary, it's probably best avoided. Um, oh, this is all single lines. So migraine is what I'm really talking about. It's extremely common, it happens more often in women than men. Uh, and there's some sort of hormonal uh, factors involved there apparently because the two lines of the two genders diverge kind of at puberty and, and start to get closer again uh, in later life. Um, but it can happen at almost any age and it's extremely common depending on which study you look at, um, something like a third or so of people will have some trouble with migraine at some point in their lives. Um, as a migraine doctor, I'm probably guilty of diagnosing lots of people with migraines. <laughs> so it's probably even higher than that in my clinic. Um, certainly nobody's immune to migraine. Nobody could sort of say, oh, I can't get a migraine. I mean, maybe you've never had one yet. Uh, and you know, hopefully you won't, but you could, you know, it's such a common part of the human experience. Um, so migraine is a brain disorder. I'm not gonna bore you with the details of all the sort of biology, um, but this has to do with patterns of brain activity that change. And the analogy I like to use for patients is this is effectively a pattern of software. The brain has a structure as an organ and has brain parts, brain cells that are connected to a certain pattern, but then it does things in real time, just like a computer program that runs on top of the computer machine, right? And so different brain cells sort of send more or less electrical signals in one direction or another. Or there's different patterns of uh, messages that go from one part of the brain or another via chemical signals and things like that. Blood vessels dilate and contract and it's all very busy. 
Um, migraine is a pattern of altered brain activity, which correlates with the pain and other sort of symptoms with the migraine. Um, and that can happen both sort of acutely in the short term and over the longer term chronically. Um, so I guess I'm gonna cover most of this later. We'll just skip that one. So we have different sort of diagnoses within the syndrome of migraine, whether it's episodic or chronic. Some patients have what we call a migraine aura without pain. This fancy word, acephalgic, just means headache free. So painless migraine aura, where there's a visual disturbance, so usually a no headache. So there's various variations on a the theme. Um, migraine is quite individual, and everybody's story is probably at least a little bit different. But there are some commonalities, you know, some patterns of symptoms that are pretty um, similar from patient to patient, so that we can recognize the pattern uh, when we see it. Um, Here's the diagnostic criteria for episodic migraine, which you don't need to read this in detail as I'm talking, don't worry. But the basic point is that one type of headache is quite famous among doctors as a pattern of migraine, a headache that's on one side of the head and throbbing or pounding. Um, that's the first two things here, unilateral location and pulsating quality. Um, when we have someone with a headache like that, it's almost certainly a migraine. But even without those two features or either of them, the pain's on both sides of the head instead of one. And if it's a steady kind of pain, instead of throbbing or pounding, it still can be a migraine, as long as the headache is pretty bad, moderately severe or worse, and it worsens with activity, so it limits what the person does. And that means that many, many, many types of headaches that people think of as tension type headaches or just a headache type of headaches will qualify as migraine if it's on both sides of the head and slows you down or changes what you do. I would call it a migraine, or at least potentially would, based on other things, right? Um, and that's one reason why doctors like me who see a lot of headache patients tend to diagnose more of them with migraine than doctors who don't see as many headache patients and aren't as familiar with these kind of criteria. So if you have a lot of headaches and they're there almost all the time, you probably meet these criteria for pain. And we would probably consider a case like that to be uh, related to migraine. So here's a slide on migraine aura, which is a really fascinating topic and can take all sorts of different features on. But it's often a pattern of visual disturbance, sometimes other kinds of sensory experiences like dizziness or tingling or other sorts of things like that. This can occur as like a separate event kind of lasting for 10, 20, 30 minutes before a headache starts, or it can happen during the headache or come and go while a migraine headache is going on. It can also happen by itself painlessly, as I was saying. Um, not everybody who gets migraine headaches get migraine auras, um, but many of them do in one form or another. Um, so there's this pattern of evolution from episodic migraine, from occasional migraine headaches to what we call chronic migraine, where the migraines happen more often. Um, and that's often sort of something where a person can cycle from one to the other and back and forth several times in a lifetime. They can at one point often start with oh, just occasional migraines and then end up having sort of more constant or frequent migraines uh, as they get older or their migraine syndrome intensifies for various reasons. And there's some biological mechanisms by which we think that happens and some things that, that potentially can modify one's risk of having that happen. Um, but one of the key points is that if there's just a lot of pain and suffering that tends to tune up the system. So we try to control migraines as much as we can to prevent that happening. Um, so diagnostic criteria for chronic migraine, don't worry about this in detail either, but the key point is just that a person with migraines who has some form of headache at least more often than not, like over half the days of a month, and many or most of those are kind of migraineous headaches, like pretty bad headaches, will qualify for a diagnosis of chronic migraine. So it's a fairly common thing. Um, most guesstimates put it around one or 2% of the population, which in Saskatchewan would be well over 10,000 people. Um, Underrecognized forms of migraine, when you're a migraine doctor like me, maybe you see everything as migraine potentially. So a lot of my patients will tell me, oh, I don't get migraines, but I get sinus headaches, or I only get headaches with my menstrual periods, or I don't have migraines, but I have this aching pain at the back of my neck that's always there. Depending on the details and the rest of the story, again, a migraine doctor like me might see that this has some elements of migraine to it. Um, and there's associations with other sort of neurological problems that I won't get into here. So, and there's some other even more unusual and, and sometimes even fairly bizarre syndromes that can actually be sort of like migraine equivalents. A syndrome in children where they have recurring attacks of vomiting uh, can be related to migraine. 
some weird symptoms where people have visual symptoms that never go away. So every time they look anywhere, their vision is all kind of like, like snow, we say, like, uh, like a TV, like the HBO logo with a kind of sound, right? Uh, that kind of thing. Um, people with tingling symptoms that often get diagnosed as having TIAs or are being worked up with concern for MS. Um, paresthesia is the medical word for kind of a tingling, numbing sensation, and a bunch of other things aside. So as a migraine doctor, I see all sorts of interesting things that people go through and probably weird things that other doctors are not sure what to make of. They tend to send to me. Uh, so I have quite a lot of experience of uh, unusual things that people can experience um, from their nervous systems. So this is the main thing I want to talk about. And I guess if I check my time, maybe I have about 10 minutes left. Is that close? Is that about right? Okay. So migraine is associated with a pattern of something we call stimulus sensitivity. And the basic idea there is that something that would normally just be noticeable becomes unpleasantly noticeable. It's sort of too strong or too intense. Um, and so this is best described during migraine headaches for lights, uh, noises, um, scents. Oops, I went back too far, I'm sorry. I'm new at working with these slides, I apologize. Um, so this is an example of a study done using PET scans to see how the brain works in real time. This is a live breathing people uh, and we're measuring the brain activity and trying to connect it to how they feel. And they were shining in this case, uh, like a dark light, like a light that you wouldn't normally be able to see. Uh, and seeing if the visual cortex, like the part of the brain at the back of the head that responds to vision recognizes it. And you'll see during a migraine headache, these people were sort of more aware of this light at the brain cell level than they were otherwise. So the brain cells were legitimately tuned up. In other words, the people who are sensitive as they say they are, they aren't lying. You know, it's actually happening that they really do experience it on a brain cell level. They're feeling something there. Okay. It's a mild stimulus, but it's real. The analogy I sometimes use with patients is the princess and the pea, you know, the old like fairy tale, right? Where the, the girl who's grown up in the fancy family has to sleep and somebody puts a pea under the mattress to see if she'll notice it. I think it's a test to see if she's really the princess or something, whatever. I haven't read the story since I was a kid, but, but she actually notices it. And in a way that's like, oh, she's weird because she's so fancy or something, but she's really noticing a real pea. It's real pea. Like most people don't notice it, but she notices it. Okay. And it's not a hallucination. She's not crazy. She's noticing something that's real. Right. So migraine is hypersensitivity is the idea that there's these things outside there that you notice and you might notice them more than other people. And that sort of dynamic pattern of like, do we notice something or not? is not exclusive to migraine. In fact, it's normal for the nervous system in general. So sensory processing for the brain and the way it makes sense of the world outside us and inside our bodies. The analogy I like to use is a mixing board. Okay. So you've got like the classic rock band with all the instruments that are plugged into different microphones and stuff like that. And, you know, you can kind of slide one thing up and listen to the drums and slide the other thing up. And here's the sax solo or something, right? If it's Stevie Dan or something from the seventies. Um, and, um, and you can remix it in real time. And that's how your brain works. Okay. So you have all these monitors for the world around you and for the world inside you. And you tune those monitors up and down based on various things like what you're paying attention to and other things like that. Although sometimes that process is not entirely voluntary, but it can be. So if I ask you right now, if your feet are sweaty, I can make you think about your feet. And when you weren't thinking about your feet a second ago, when I said Steely Dan, or you saw the picture of Paul McCartney, you weren't thinking about your feet. But now that I said, are your feet sweaty? We can say, do you have socks on? Are you wearing shoes? What kind of flooring is under there? Is there carpet or tile or whatever? I was working at the hospital today, so my feet are sweaty. You know, when's the last time you cut your nails? Is there some piece of skin falling off your foot? The more I talk about your feet, all that information is there but it was coming into a channel that was kind of muted. Now that we're talking feet, that slider gets pushed up. So that's normal, right? To be able to move sliders up and down and tune the system up and down to some extent. Uh, and we do that all the time without thinking about it. Um, but sometimes that system betrays us. And in particular, these real sensations can be too intense in a way that makes us sick. And the classic example, that's actually motion sickness not even necessarily associated with migraine, although many of my migraine sufferers were motion sick or have been motion sick over the years. And one that thankfully is quite well understood among lay people and general people, and it's all accepted as real, you know, because everybody's had the situation where like I did as a dad, 
like the kid's like, oh, I'm not feeling so good. And you're like, oh, you'll be fine. And then like five minutes later, you're cleaning up the back seat, right? Because it's like, oh yeah, they're legitimately sick. You know, they'll barf on themselves, right? So it's like, it's not optional. It's not trivial. And it's real motion, right? But interestingly, like the motion is not a disease or damaging. And the way the inner ear perceives the motion is actually very similar from person to person, especially in kids. Their neurology, the inner ear is almost the same all the way across. And that system is like really old evolutionarily. It's in all sorts of animals, like birds have the same thing almost. And so like, that's not why you're sick. It's not inner ear problem. It's the top part of the brain, the mixing board. Like, do you tune that down and ignore it? Or is it like getting broadcast, like really loud? and like cranked up and amplified. So the motion, motion of the like car or the school bus or whatever makes you sit, right? So that's a really good metaphor for like intensification of stimuli, right? And again, like usually with a real sort of source. So central sensitization is this idea that, you know, stimuli can be painful, basically. Stimuli from inside the body, especially, can be experienced as pain and or pain can be more painful than usual okay so central sensitization is basically like a high sensitivity kind of idea like a mixing board with too many sliders pushed up and that can just happen sort of in part maybe by that's the way the person is wired you know we don't get to choose if we're motion sick right nobody would sign up for that but some people are right um you know and sometimes that can change over time Right? And people can become more or less, or they just sort of find themselves one day suddenly getting seasick where they never used to or something like that. Right? And so in central sensitization, in terms of body pain and pain from the rest of the body, that can be amplified. And we see this all the time in migraine. So many of my chronic migraine patients have chronic pain syndromes in the rest of their body. Many of them carry other diagnoses like fibromyalgia or endometriosis or irritable bowel syndrome or many other things. Um, and I'm sure they have other sorts of problems related to those things, but part of the story for me as their neurologist is that they're suffering from chronic pain. Um, and that tends to correlate, as I say, um, with central sensitization. So maybe the last two about central sensitization is that this often responds to something as a feeling of threat, okay? And so I like the metaphor of a security station. So you have like the building that's got all the sensors for the doors and the windows and the cameras on the loading docks and whatever. And you've got the security guard kind of watching to see, do I need to call upstairs and report a problem or are we okay? And every so often a light goes off or a, you know, some door gets banged by the wind or something and you get an alert and the security guard's got to look at that and go, is that okay? Oh, I guess it's a false alarm. It's just a cat. I'm not anything but once in a while they got to push the red button and kind of you know wake the guy up upstairs and make something happen call the cops or whatever so that's normal right to have sensors and monitors that scan for threats but when we're hyper vigilant which is a word that shows up a lot in psychiatry around trauma right then we're on the edge of our seat and we're watching for threats even when there aren't any coming so when there are things coming, and this is a famous Calvin and Hobbes strip that I love as an example of hypervigilance, like when you're a six-year-old in a tent with your stuffed tiger, you better be vigilant, right? You know, you're pretty vulnerable. Okay, sure, there's probably just a raccoon in the woods or whatever, but like it could be a bear, I guess, and you got nothing. To some, I guess you got a baseball bat. That's pretty smart. But like, you know, he's vulnerable. But if he's not that vulnerable, that level of vigilance, right, of watching out for threat, can turn up all these sliders and make us more sensitive to pain. And that leads to real pain, much as motion sickness is real sickness. But the source of that pain can be a dynamic function of how the system works in amplifying and distorting what would be otherwise more innocuous stimuli, okay? Um, that's the concept. And in chronic migraine, it's even more so than that because there isn't anything really wrong with the brain at all. So it's not even that there's arthritis in the neck that's being turned up. The brain is structurally healthy. The whole problem has to do with sensory processing and the software of the brain. So that's the main thing I wanted to talk about. And then I've got some stuff about trigger threshold theory for migraine, which is sort of applying that central sensitization model um, to migraine, um, avoiding certain triggers and what sorts of triggers are often common for certain people. Um, where my 
bottom line is try and take good care of yourself. You know, it's like such a cliche to say to patients, but it's one of the things I say the most, you know yourself better than I do and you do the things that are good for you. Um, and then I have a bunch of things about acute migraine treatment, about chronic migraine treatment uh, with different medications. A lot of this stuff is for doctors and don't worry about the details. Um, we have some, um, you know, very specific and fancy new medications like Botox, which I'm sure you've heard of, and maybe some of these other uh, injectable treatments like Amivig and Ajovi. Again, I put this in the talk originally for a medical audience and you don't need to worry about the details. Um, there are many other things that people do to help with headaches is the one last thing I want to say. I'm a medical doctor and so I do medications, but I respect the fact that there's many ways to help people who are suffering. And some of them say, oh, you know, your pills are no good for me, but this other person helped me a lot. And I'm always happy. I don't get jealous. I'm just like, okay, great. If you found something that helped you, go with that. All right. Because there's lots of ways to get better from suffering. I don't have to be the only answer. I just have to be good at my part of the job. And so I do what I can do with medications of various sorts um, and try to give some useful advice. But, um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, caring and intelligent people out there who want to help. And so anyone uh, who can be part of that journey in terms of helping someone improve their quality of life and reduce their suffering, I think that's very valid. Okay. Um, oh yeah, I guess I talked too much, but hopefully that wasn't way too long. Do you have any questions? That was, yeah, excellent and very informative. Oh, here's the first question. Okay. Do medications work to decrease the sensitivity? Yes, is the short version. Um, although I'm not sure that we've ever had a great study that shows that specifically or independently from their effect on things like the headaches. But one of the things that I like to do in patients with chronic pain is try to put a low dose of something in the mix. If they're open to taking medications, that's part of their um, approach. Uh, I like a drug like nortriptyline, which is cheap and safe, doesn't have a lot of side effects. Um, many of you may have tried it for various reasons, and some of you may have found it wasn't helpful. Um, but for some people, it does help quite a bit. And especially medications can be helpful when you conceive of them as trying to help or helping a bit or putting a thumb on the scale and sort of dragging in a certain direction. When you think the medications are cures, well, we got to put you on this pill. And unless all the headaches are gone, then this was no good, right? In that sense, most migraine medications fail, even the really fancy ones um, don't make people bulletproof. So the best we can do is usually trend in the right direction. Let's make some progress. Let's make you feel somewhat better so other things can start to work better and the whole thing gets better together, you know? That's the plan. So, uh, so a little bit of medication can help with that. Um, so I, I like to do that if I can. Okay, yeah. There's another question from Dawn. I feel helpless when my daughter has a migraine, she says. Whoops, I've lost it here. I have to go back. Uh, what is the best way to help without increasing her without increasing her stress to the situation or increasing stress to the situation? That's a really good question. Yeah, it's it's horrible. People with migraines look terrible. They're, it's, they're very sick. It's migraine is so weird. If it wasn't for it being so common, it would be enormously strange, right? The people can just they look like they're dying sometimes, right? And then like the next day they're fine. And it's like, really? You're okay. <laughs> if it wasn't for the fact that like a third of the world has had that happen, we'd think they were making it up, right? So it is very intense, right? And you know, the natural response is, especially as a parent, is to just take care of them, right? So yeah, you know, just keeping them comfortable, keeping them calm, getting them something to drink, giving them some medications if they can. I'm not sure from the question how old the, the child is or if this is even an adult or something. Like it all depends on, on what their stage is and what you do for them exactly. But just taking care and being present. Also having some realization, this is a thing that they do. The more often it happens, weirdly, sometimes the more comfortable we all get. One of the things I end up teaching people about migraine is that it's strange, but like the first time is terrible. But like about the 11th time, you're like, oh yeah, this again, right? Here we go. I know what this is. And so I call it the devil you know, right? Which I like, oh, hello, are you still there? Yeah, I, we're still okay. here. Oh, I just stopped the sharing. Yeah, so um, I like the phrase the devil you know because it gives the devil its due, right? It's truly a bad thing, but it's something familiar. And so you learn, here's what I do when the devil comes around, right? This is how I get through it. These are the things that work for me. And a lot of it's like um, 
the fancy word is empiricism or empirical approach, right? But I know more nice way of saying it's just like trial and error, just common sense. You do the stuff that works for you. You try this and it doesn't work. And so the next time you don't try that, you try something else. And over yeah. time, you come to some understanding of this is how I like it. This is the way it goes. This is my migraine kind of, right? And it is this sort of individual experience for most people. Um, there's one more question here from Susan. Thanks so much for the excellent presentation. You mentioned that criteria for migraine included increased headache with activity. She mm -hmm. asks, is that just physical activity or is that also mental activity, concentration <laughs> and focus? It's a great question. Yeah. The, by the dictionary definition, I believe mental or physical activity is the only one that qualifies, but certainly that's just such a common story. And so like basically a good way to think about it, migraine for doctors is that anybody who's having a headache that really badly affects them, you know, and significantly changes how they're doing um, things. Then there are some other things on the list of possible headaches, including the rare, serious, dangerous things that we'll just ignore here. Um, the main other type of headache that people talk about is tension type headache. Um, but generally that should go away as soon as you kind of change the vibe, change the mood in the room. The kids say vibe. So I say vibe now. Um, so, you know, like you, you get, uh, as soon as you kind of get out of that stuffy classroom, you know, where you've been cooped up all morning and your head starts to hurt and you walk around a bit and take a few breaths of fresh air and you have like a half a cup of coffee and your headache's gone. That's probably not a migraine. Okay. The migraine should be sort of worse and should sort of impair you more than the situation normally would or something like that. Um, would be a good way of thinking about it. Yeah, great. Thanks so much. All right. uh, many people here are saying that, that you had a great presentation and thank you. And it was very good. So thank you for that presentation. I'm glad to hear that. Thanks for the feedback, everyone. I appreciate it. Yes. So we'll move right along, everyone. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to our next speaker for today, Kendra Soika. Kendra is married with two amazing kids, ages six and two. Kendra works part-time as a pharmacist and states that she is also a recovering perfectionist and a wannabe gardener. Kendra lives with migraines. And so Kendra, I'll pass it over to you for your presentation. Thanks very much, Erin. Uh, I want to thank Partners in Pain for the opportunity to speak to you all tonight. Um, it's been a rough last few years for everyone, I'm sure. Um, and then to add chronic pain on top of that can be a totally isolating experience. So when I got the opportunity to do this, I jumped at it um, because to even meet virtually is better than not at all. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, when I started thinking about what I would say to you all tonight, I, I thought back on my life and I came to the realization that my pain journey really divided into two legs of a journey, um, a lot like the rest of my life, but I think of it as before I had kids and after I had kids. So before I had my kids, um, I was a kid who was a worrier. I had a lot of anxiety as a child, lots of stomach aches. So that typical type A overachieving perfectionist um, personality from day one. And I, I knew that headaches would probably be in my future because my grandmother suffered from them. And she told me that before I even remembered um, that I had a headache. So I must have been two or three years old and she cried and she cried. She couldn't believe it. She's like, you're going to suffer just like me. So I was set on, on the road to suffering from migraines. And that's kind of what I did for the first half of my journey. Um, I don't remember much about pain uh, when I was in elementary school, but definitely once I got into high school, which would make sense um, as the hormones start um, flowing, I, I suffered from definitely regular headaches at that point. Um, and then they worsened into my 20s and 30s. And all I just, all I'm going to say about that time of my life is that I was a pretty miserable individual for most of that time. Um, and I was actually pretty unwilling to do anything about it now that I look back on it, which is, which is a shame. Um, in, my, in my 20s and 30s, I also dealt with a, a number of other issues. I found out I was uh, celiac, um, so gluten was triggering some of my chronic pain. I had pain other than uh, headaches, which 
um, as Dr. Majowski told us, is quite common. So it's nice to know I'm not abnormal. Um, so a lot of just chronic body aches, headaches, rashes. Once we found the celiac um, piece, that really helped um, with the rest of my chronic pain. It helped reduce my headaches, um, but they were still there and still affecting my life to a pretty good degree. Uh, we also discovered once we got married that um, we were gonna have trouble getting pregnant. So I was suffering from infertility as well. So there was a lot of anxiety, depression, um, um, unmet expectations that I had for my life at that point. And I think it all just spiraled and it all just went downhill for me. Um, and I really don't know what started me to come out of that spiral, except that I decided that I wasn't going to uh, keep living my life that way. If there was something I could do about it, I was going to do it. So the first thing I tackled was, of course, getting on a gluten free diet. The second thing I tackled was um, asking for help. So uh, the help that I wanted the most at that point was to have a child. So we um, went for in vitro fertilization treatments in 2015. And we were so, so lucky and blessed to be um, successful our first try. And our daughter was born in 2016. And you might think that was the happiest day of my life, but I'm gonna be honest and say that when she came out and I found out that she was a girl, I cried. Of course, I was happy to start, but then when I saw my doctor after, I cried because what my Nana had told me, I'm gonna pass this on to her and she's gonna suffer like this. Now, that's totally unreasonable, but you can tell it still affects me um, because boys can have headaches too, but I was just bound and convinced that if I had a girl, it was going to be like this for her. So um, we had this beautiful baby girl. We came home. My headaches actually went away during pregnancy, my migraines. I had regular headaches, but those were easy to deal with compared to the migraines. And then they didn't come back for quite a while after I had her. And then about six to eight months after she was born, they came back. And parenting with a migraine, as I'm sure parenting with any type of pain, is absolute hell. I do not wish that on anybody, but what it did for me is it, it made me ask for help. It made me admit to myself that I couldn't do it. It made me admit to myself that I needed to change something. Um, and it was, it was slow going at first, because of course we had this new baby and we were busy with her and I wasn't really taking absolute best care of myself, but eventually um, she was about two years old and I was down and out on the floor with another migraine, cold pack on my head, heating pack on my neck, just down for the count. And she, she came over and she laid her head on my shoulder and she said, I'm sorry, your head hurts, mommy. And it broke my heart. <laughs> And then I was like, I cannot keep doing this to her. She cannot see me suffer like this because she's going to learn that this is normal. This is how life is. And that's not what I want for her. So at that point, I got the motivation to change and I started looking for options. Along the way, I had been introduced to triptans and anti-inflammatories and all those good drugs. And being a pharmacist, I was kind of all about the drugs for a long, long time. Um, but now I needed, I knew I needed to do something different. So um, I did, um, I, I don't know how I came upon it, but I did some sort of search maybe for an online pain um, tool or something to use because I didn't want to be traveling all over the places for appointments and things like that. When you live rural, it's a lot of work to be sick and a lot of work to be in pain. So I was looking for something easy to start with. And I stumbled upon the Curable app. And I don't know if anyone is familiar with it or has used it, but if you are um, struggling, that would be a really easy um, thing to use. And I absolutely, it changed my life. It talks about the neuroscience of pain. So being a pharmacist, I'm a bit of a nerd. So I love to learn about these types of things. And 
being a pharmacist, you'd think I'd know about this type of stuff already, but I, I didn't. Uh, we didn't really learn about that in school. So learning about the neuroscience of pain, learning about the effects of my emotions, learning about um, meditation and breathing and all those things um, was just really great. And they also have a panic button that you push when you're in pain. So when you have a headache, you push the lightning button. I pushed a lot of lightning buttons in, in the first, you know, three to six months after I started using that app, but it, it really, it helped a lot. So that was the first thing I started with. Um, I started taking um, prophylaxis for the first time. I never had wanted to before because I was afraid of the side effects of the medication, but I decided that procranolol would be a good um, option for me and it worked well. And then my sister, who happens to be, you know, the person who's probably given me the best advice in my life over the years, she said to me, um, why don't you look into seeing an osteopath? And I'm like, what is an osteopath? And she said, well, they work with bones and, and muscles and they manipulate them. And I said, oh, why would I do that? She's like, well, it's supposed to be good for headaches. And her son, uh, he was only three or four months old and he was having some issues and um, they were treating him, an osteopath was treating him and it was working. So I thought, well, there's no way that can be placebo effect because he's only three or four months old. What does he know about an osteopath? So I set my um, judgments aside and I found um, a practitioner reasonably close to me in Regina and I started seeing her in May of 2019. And when I met with her, I told her my story and she's like, oh, I can definitely help you. She said, we'll do these manipulations. So there was like head manipulations and pelvis manipulation. She's like, this is pretty powerful medicine. It is possible that you could wind up getting pregnant. And because it took me 10 and a half years to get pregnant with IVF, I just laughed at her and I said, you know what? If I get pregnant, you're going to be my hero forever. She's like, okay, but I warned you. So I saw her for probably half a year. And lo and behold, December 2019, I'm feeling really crummy, like so crummy. And I'm like, sick to my stomach all the time. I think I better just check just to be sure, because we were going to have a party or something. And I should check a, a pregnancy test and see. And sure enough, it was positive. And I was blown away. And I was like, all on my own, as, as if this happens, right? <laughs> so we had another babe. And uh, he's wonderful. And again, my headaches went away during my pregnancy. Um, I had lots of other issues, but headaches weren't one of them. And uh, he was born in July of 2020. So he's a COVID baby. I had to stop seeing the osteopath because of COVID. So that was kind of unfortunate, but I was managing pretty well for that point. And nine days after our son was born, I ended up in the hospital with a heart attack. So again, my life changed overnight and the way I managed my migraines had to change as well, because of course, with increased cardiovascular risk, I'm not going to be using a triptan and I'm not going to be using an NSAID anymore. So no Aleve, no naproxen, no ibuprofen, nothing like that. So now how I manage my migraines um, is I really try and take care of myself. Um, I go for regular massages. I do acupuncture when I'm having a flare. I do yoga, anything to relax me, anything to reduce the stress uh, in my life. I'm all about that. Um, and just noticing when I need to ask for help and really trying hard to be accepting of help when it's offered. Um, um, yeah, so... When I do treat my migraines now, I'm limited to just metoclopramide and Tylenol. If it's really bad, I'll add an aspirin. Uh, but the thing I need to do now is treat it at the very moment that I know it's happening. Because if I let it get too far gone, it's just not going to be good for me. So my best advice uh, that I got about dealing with pain and dealing with just stress in general, other than get yourself to an osteopath, which obviously turned out very well for us, um, was something I read in the book by Mark Manson. And he wrote um, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Bleep uh, book. And in it, he talks about the do something principle. So 
that really made a difference in my life um, just to do something. If you're not feeling like you can do anything, do something. It can be the smallest thing, but by doing that, you can motivate yourself to make bigger changes. So to me, that's like, if I'm feeling bad about my house not being clean, well, I can clean out a drawer. Then maybe I'll feel like cleaning up a room and then maybe I'll feel about cleaning a little bit more. So when I don't feel like I have a purpose or I don't have motivation, I feel worse. So I always try and make sure that I'm not letting my pain get the best of me. I'm doing something to try and overcome it. Um, if I'm due to work that day and I have a migraine, I always at least try to get to work because if even if I show up late, um, it's better than not showing up at all. And chances are that if I go, something will distract me. I'll be so busy that that pain will recede into the background. And by the end of the day, I might not even have a headache anymore. So for me, it's just managing to stay on top and getting ahead of the pain. Whereas in my younger years, I'd let the pain get a hold of me and it, it wouldn't let go. The best advice I have never taken, and I don't know how many of you do this, but Curable talks about it. Any kind of um, stress management or mental health um, program will talk about journaling. And that's something I just haven't managed to wrap my head around doing, but I know it would be so helpful. I think part of the reason why I don't do it is I'm scared of putting my thoughts down on paper, having someone else see them because, you know, it's pretty dark in there, pretty scary sometimes. So I don't know, maybe one day I'll get around to it. Um, but the bottom line is, after everything I've gone through, I actually am thankful for my headaches because if it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't be here with the two great kids I have now, the great life I have now. So I'm just, you know, you have to find the positives in the pain. And that's all I have. Great presentation, Kendra. That's very insightful. And you've um, been through a lot in your life. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to see that you're doing good now. Yeah, like really, when I think back, I don't know. I'm surprised anyone stuck with me because it, it was dark. But you just have to have, you have to have a reason to find the reason. Yeah, absolutely. Um, something that I was wondering, because I'm a massage therapist by trade, what, um, how were your headaches? Like what would trigger your headaches or did you have auras? Like what kind of headaches did you have? How did you know? I'm, I think I've had maybe two auras in my life and, um, most of the time it was not, uh, aura related. It would be actually an upset stomach to start. And I would wait because I wasn't sure that would be a headache. So I wouldn't treat it right away. And then boom, it would go into my head or it would start in my neck and make its way up and then kind of just explode out through my eye, one or both eyes. So yeah, oh. it really affected my life. I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't do anything. Yeah. 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 As migraines do, hey, they do. When you can't think and it's in your head, it's hard to do anything. But uh, it's nice to see, like, I love the part where you say you just go, you go to work and you can tell that distracting yourself helps, right? It's that pain sensitization, right? Where your body isn't so hypervigilant and you're distracting yourself so that your brain isn't thinking about pain, 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 pain. So yeah. now I'm thinking about Paul McCartney and my sweaty feet. So it's all better. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Great presentation. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions before we get going? Yeah. Tom I'm watching here. the chat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can relate to Kendra very well. It, we might be a little different, but I can relate. And uh, I did journal in the last five and a half years of my life. And I'm really happy I did because there's things I wrote down and what I went through day by day. It is a good thing to do. Very good. Okay, you did a good job. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And and helpful when you go to see a specialist or something, right? Because like the days blend together, the pain blends together. Like I really should have been doing it, but I just no, I think, I'm just like pff, crash into bed. I'm lucky to do yeah. brush my teeth. 
really. <laughs> yeah. I have a habit of doing mine first thing in the morning. And uh, <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> then it's over with. But whatever. It's all good. Yes. <laughs> good. I'm going to take that away. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Kendra. We'll move on to our next speaker, which is Hilary Stamantinos. So Hilary is a clinical pharmacist and the store operator of Lauk's MediHealth Pharmacy in Yorkton. She specializes in both geriatric pharmacy and has completed additional courses to be a certified diabetes educator, as well as additional courses in palliative care. Hilary balances out her demanding pharmacy schedule with her love of gardening, which she finds gives a great outlet for creativity and provides an excellent distraction on extra stressful days. Hillary is expecting her first child in August. Congratulations. I didn't know that, Hillary. <laughs> and to do this has been having to modify and adapt her gardening approach to accommodate limited physical ability and achy joints. She is very much looking forward to sharing some tips and tricks to adapt gardening to your own unique physical capabilities. So I'll turn it over to you, Hillary. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erin, for the nice introduction. Uh, I was joking with Erin uh, and Celine before we started here that I could probably talk about gardening all day. So <laughs> there might be a point where they have to cut me off here. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. Um, 10 minutes. But, uh, 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, stick, I'll stick to it, I promise. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Um, but uh, to, just a caveat, uh, like, like Kendra, I'm a, a pharmacist by trade. I've had absolutely no formal uh, education uh, in gardening. It's just a passion project that I love uh, learning about. And uh, I've, heard, I've heard that same theme come up a lot in all of these uh, sessions. You know, when you're dealing with pain, it's, it's good to have a, a distraction. You keep hearing that word. Um, Dr. Mazowski um, touched on that too, you know, with the, with the lowering signals uh, to get the distractions. So this is just uh, one example of uh, something that you can do, but find, find one that works for you for sure. I'm going to start sharing my screen here because uh, I did prepare a small uh, PowerPoint presentation here. So there have been many benefits uh, to gardening or just being out in nature, as we all intuitively know, uh, but there has been some recent studies that have uh, kind of helped us along getting some evidence finally on, on that as well. So one interesting study uh, that I uh, re recently have been reading was uh, one where they actually looked at uh, different patients that were hospitalized. Um, and then put them either in a, a program where say they were getting outside in nature or uh, even a really interesting one was where they just had a view from their hospital room window of a green space or a garden. Uh, and they did find that those patients uh, did statistically uh, significantly um, uh, recover a little bit faster than those that didn't. And they rated their overall quality of life and their perception of pain quite a bit better. Uh, and then, of course, we all know low impact exercise uh, that we can do to the best of our ability uh, generally will help with our quality of life as well. So we're going to touch on some modifications uh, and some tips to reduce uh, some physical labor in gardening because it can be really labor intensive. Um, so you, you only really want to do as much as your body feels capable doing. Uh, and then at the end, uh, time permitting, <laughs> we have a uh, a little activity part of it where we're going to kind of plan through building our own garden container here too. Uh, so some modifications that you could do to help with gardening. The number one that I really like is uh, to try to get some raised garden beds or even go with container gardening if you can't quite uh, make it to do the landscape gardening in the land. Um, the benefit of the raised garden beds is there's a lot less weeding because there's a lot less seeds that can you know blow in and, and start germinating and get uh, get going on your crop. Um, also you can build it to any height you want so you can have an ergonomic height and you can also control the soil quality which which will help a lot with your plant health. Uh, the second one my favorite right now is get help <laughs> with more physically demanding tasks if you need to. 
Uh, so <laughs> this is probably my husband's least favorite point <laughs> of this presentation. Uh, but again, just with the pregnancy mobility issues for me right now, um, a lot more loose joints leading to aches and pains. Um, he's doing a lot of the digging, um, hauling mulch, things like that. And I'm doing a lot more directing <laughs> outside. So, you know, if you, you have a family or friend that can do that or a, a nice um, neighbor kid that you can hire to, to do that with a good strong back, um, that, that'll help a lot too. Another one is use support. So if you know, uh, kneeling pads, very cheap, very inexpensive to buy, really will save your knees and back. Um, a good tip is if you have your raised garden bed built to a height where you can comfortably sit in a chair and make sure that it's not too deep so you can reach while doing that. So you don't have to be standing the whole time. Uh, and of course, uh, invest in some good supportive gardening shoes if you're able. Another one is you want to strategically plan out your garden or place rain barrels or a water source um, around where you're going to be. So, you know, if you're going to do some container gardening, try to put it near your water barrel just so you're not lugging water everywhere. Um, another one is you can, if uh, you're willing to invest a little bit more, you could set up a drip irrigation system um, or even use grow bags, which is a, a really interesting thing. I was actually just uh, touring at Over the Hills Orchard uh, and they have hundreds of um, strawberry and hascap plants that they're planting, but they've actually put them all in individual grow bags. And then they've uh, created a shallow container that all of those bags are in. So the bags, it, uh, it's a material that wicks up the water easily. So they can just plop a hose into that container, fill it up with about an inch of water, and then water hundreds of plants simultaneously. So it's kind of like a, a cheap way to do a, an irrigation system. Uh, the next one, of course, take lots of breaks, stay hydrated, uh, only do what you can do, listen to your body. Uh, and then, of course, uh, as well as adapting the physical labor, if you can choose plants that are well suited to your environment, those will be healthier plants and those will be plants that will require a lot less work. So you want to choose some low maintenance plants if that's going to be an issue. So do your research <laughs> before you purchase. Uh, so for instance, hostas, uh, if you're going with uh, flower gardening, which I like to do a little more than vegetable gardening, it's a very nice low maintenance, high impact plant. Um, choose plants that require a little deadheading. So, you know, old varieties of petunia hanging baskets, you could spend all day deadheading those and get kind of all cramped up, but newer varieties, um, a, lot, a lot less easier. Um, often they'll just bury their dead, which means you don't have to deadhead at all. Um, to get repeat blooms or nice looking flowers. Uh, next, choose the right plant for the right spot. So <laughs> you've all seen tags um, on plants, they'll say full sun, part shade, um, drought tolerant, things like that. You just want to make sure that you're putting a plant where it's going to be happy so it'll be less work for you. Um, choose plants depending on your climate and watering needs. Uh, so we'll just kind of, I'm going to start skipping these a bit, but I'll provide my notes after because we only have about two minutes left here. Um, choose plants with low pest issues. Um, choose beneficial or companion plants. It's another great one. Um, so the fun part here for our last two minutes. Uh, I want us to all uh, think about planning a, a container garden. Um, so a pot garden with some nice flowers in it uh, can just be a really, really great activity here. Um, so for me, I wanted to plan out a really low maintenance garden container. So I start off with my um, requirements of where I want to put my container. So I want to put mine in kind of a part sun, part shade area. I'm going to have it nice and close to my rain barrel. So I don't have to worry about getting anything that uh, is going to dry out, anything like that. Um, and then my next step is what kind of color scheme do I want? So you can either go with varying shades of similar colors, which can be quite common, or you can go with high impact contrast colors. Um, so often in garden design, they'll say if you can get a red, a blue, a green, and a yellow, um, that'll have a really nice contrast. Um, and then cooling tones versus hot tones, things like that. Um, consider different foliage and textures. So something like silver falls or ornamental grasses has a really fine texture. It tends to look really nice with broad leafed plants. So something like a coleus or a hosta. Um, and then they say for maximum impact, if you're going to do a container, um, try to get a thriller, a spiller and a filler. So the thriller is a nice tall plant. Spiller will spill over the sides and then the filler will um, 
take up the middle part. Um, a nice healthy economic tip is if you're doing a filler, you can even try doing lettuce there, um, which looks really quite nice. And then you also get a, a good treat too. <laughs> uh, but you don't have to follow that thriller filler filler method. That's one thing you can experiment with. Sometimes you can have high impact just only doing filler. So here's uh, my example container that I tried to uh, uh, take off of a proven winner's suggestion for one of their example containers. So what I planted here that's actually at, at my house right now looks great <laughs> is a low maintenance part sun container because um, a little bit of shade, a little bit of sun. So I chose uh, some of the snow flurry caladium, the scarlet flame caladium. So that's that, that darker foliage one right there. Uh, the surefire rose begonia, which doesn't need as much deadheading to look nice, a little more drought tolerant than a petunia, a little easier to go. And then some nice diamond snow euphorbia just to um, top it all off. So this one I like because you can see a lot of the impact is coming from the foliage. So we don't have to, you know, spend all of our time deadheading or worrying about things having to be blooming for it to look nice. So that is my <laughs> spiel on gardening. I hope you guys learned something. I don't know if we have time for uh, questions or not, but I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to Erin here. Yeah, we have time. Does anyone have any questions? I realized I do some pots too, and I do thriller, spiller, and filler, and I do that without even knowing. I just looked at things that I like. Oh, Susan yeah. says you're your plant is beautiful. I thought so too. <laughs> Just one more comment. It was good. And what, as we had this meeting tonight, uh, past our garden and into our yard, walked a black bear. So I was distracted there for a few minutes. So we were watching <laughs> it and listening to everybody else. It's pretty neat. I seen a big brown bear yesterday too. So we oh, do it. Oh. But it's pretty neat. I was very good with the garden. <laughs> yeah, we had some bears up at our cabin too, actually, just this, this past weekend. Um, so yeah, I <laughs> I totally get it. It's something yeah, no, it's, it's good. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Kathy says, uh, Hillary, that she likes your strategy to grow the lettuce with your flowers. That's a brilliant suggestion. Good idea. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else for any questions or comments? Hillary, how often do you garden? Are you out there every day? Do you like it that much? I wish I could be, um, almost. Yeah. <laughs> it's been it's been some late nights in the pharmacy world right now, <laughs> right now of course. So, yeah. you know, I, I'm kind of only getting, you know, 10 minutes here and there at the end of the day on, on the way in the door almost, you know, I'm, yeah. my husband makes fun of me because he said, you know, I'll, I'll pull up into the driveway and then it'll be about half an hour till I come inside because I'll get distracted and I'll say, well, I just need to pick a few weeds here and there and water this. <laughs> but it works. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for your presentation. So thank you to Dr. Michalski, Kendra and Hillary for sharing their time, insight and expertise today. And thank you to our sponsor for today's session, the Chiropractors Association of Saskatchewan. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.